I just want to emphasize a little bit about um, what was said by the previous speaker, and that is that uh, the idea, the ideal for tonight uh, is for those folks that want to have a conversation, have a conversation. It's not to shout, it's not to belittle, it's not to scream. I, you know, I just want to emphasize that I will not participate in any kind of discussion or any kind of rhetoric that uh, certainly would make me feel personally uncomfortable as it relates to uh, race, as it relates to ethnicity. So if it devolves into that, I'm leaving. I'm done. I'm not, I'm not going to stand here and engage in any kind of discussion. Now, if there wants to be a discussion about what our laws are, why they are the way they are, how we got here, and what probably should happen to straighten things out, that's a very positive discussion, and I'd like to participate in that. Um, but just to give you some backdrop a little bit about uh, the situation that, as I perceive it to be, is that um, what it all boils down to, whatever side of this issue you're on, what it boils down to is that we have a set of laws that are on the books that for a variety of different reasons, are not enforced. And that's the bottom line. They're not enforced. Some people may argue they're unenforceable. They're too difficult. They're archaic. They're arcane. You can't follow. Some people may argue that they're very simple and they're enforceable. Why don't you do this? But the fact of the matter is, is that the federal government of the United States has made a decision, in some cases, a very conscious decision, not to enforce the laws. And in that case, uh, the position that, that certainly I come from is that that's bad public policy not to enforce the law. Now, the argument could be, well, we ought, to, we ought to have laws that are enforceable. That's a whole other story. In fact, that's what Congress is doing right now. They're wrestling with, with various proposals. In fact, I brought with me um, a handout, which I'll leave here for folks can take. But basically, it has all of the different bills that are before Congress right now in their various stages. And they range from enforcement-only bills all the way up to uh, what people would term as amnesty bills, and everywhere in between. Uh, and even Congress, with all that education and all the big dollars that we pay them and all that stuff, still has a hard time wrestling around with this issue because it's incredibly complicated and incredibly complex. So uh, I do have this here for you, and again, like I said, I can leave it here for you and folks can look at it. So I think that when you, when you look at that, uh, that's really what it comes down to. And that's why people feel frustrated on both sides. What you see over the, over the last several months is folks are unhappy and the, over the entire spectrum again of this issue. If you're undocumented and you're, and you're clearly unhappy because there's no path to legalization. If you don't believe you should have a path to legalization, you're unhappy because the government doesn't enforce the laws that are on the books. Uh, you're mad at your local mayor because he's not out rounding up people and he should be doing that. Or you're mad at the mayor because he's... He's harassing people. They shouldn't be harassing people because they just want to have a life. So it's a very difficult uh, position to be in in terms of uh, where we are right now. But the facts are irrefutable that uh, there has been a tremendous influx of folks from literally all over the world. And I'll speak to that for a second. And that is, uh, influx continues to grow as economic conditions continue to deteriorate in other parts of the world. Uh, people feel it uh, and they want to better themselves and they want to come here. Now, there's been a lot of discussion. We see on TV a lot, if you watch Lou Dobbs, if you watch all these people that talk about this issue, uh, there's been a lot of discussion about border enforcement, you know, and building a wall and about securing the border and all this other stuff. Uh, securing the border is a necessary thing that we have to do. Every, everybody, the undocumented, will tell you we need a secure border, particularly after 9 11. But understand that 60% of the folks that are not here illegally don't have to collect paperwork are what's called adjustments to their visas. They overstay their visa. They don't cross the border. So without some kind of interior enforcement to uh, this enforce the side of this issue, you're kind of wasting your time. You can build a wall, but you're still letting 60% of the people in because they fly into on plane, overstay their, overstay their visas, because we don't have any way of tracking visas, and when you're done with your visa, leaving, uh, to make sure that you, you comply with the requirements of the visa. So basically, that would make it uh, you know, that kind of argument, I, sometimes I chuckle when I watch it on TV because that's really not what the issue is. If you had a, a clear, simple system for interior enforcement, you really wouldn't have to worry so much about border control because people, would, once they were here, if they weren't here legally, would obviously be put into the system and then uh, whatever happened, whatever happened. Um, so it's really not that difficult to do that. Now, the second question that, that people have and people say is, well, look, if you're here um, and you got here, 
uh, quite frankly, the realities of, 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 of the United States of America being able to deport 11 million people is frankly absurd. Uh, they can't get your refund check on time to you for income tax. <coughs> they suggest that they can, they can go and actually uh, uh, deport people probably isn't a practical solution. Uh, so there's really three core components to this. One, you certainly should have secure borders. I think we all agree with that. After 9-11, we need to know who's here, why they're coming here, what their intentions are, who they are. Two, you need to have a clean system of interior enforcement that makes sense, it's easy to understand, that will all do respect for people like fill out of business because they don't have to spend all this time, fill out all this difficult paperwork, they get shuffled from point A to point B to point C and then get stamped and seven years later, maybe you're here legally, maybe you're not, but you're in this no man's land of paperwork. Uh, and then three, uh, then we're going to have to make some, some public policy decisions about what to do there with everybody that's already here. But if you don't do one and two, you can't get to three because if you don't, if you don't look at the issues of security, then it gets very difficult um, because you just create a system by which more people will come and then we're, ten years from now we're back talking about more immigration reform because the first two times we tried to do more. So uh, my advice to Congress, and I'm not a congressman, I don't really have any intentions of being one, uh, would be to do something comprehensive, to figure it out, but make sure that we look in terms of security, we look in terms of interior enforcement, and we look in terms of some kind of public policy suggestion towards uh, the 11 million folks that are here already. Again, I'm a pragmatic person, I'm a practical person. I would say to you that the chances of, of deporting anybody uh, at a mass scale, uh, first of all, I don't think the American people would stomach that. Second of all, I don't think it's practical. It ain't gonna happen. So the fact of the matter is, is we gotta get along, we gotta go along, we gotta make sure that in the future we don't get ourselves back into this position again where we're sitting here arguing about um, uh, who's legal, who's not legal, how'd you get here, how'd you get here, because a lot of energy and a lot of uh, stuff has sort of been exhausted on this when we all have better things to do with our days and our time. So that's kind of what the city's position is in terms of, I can't say my position is in terms of this issue. Um, now, uh, for those folks that are enforcement only folks, enforcement will not work without a willing partner to help do the enforcement. Doesn't make sense for the city to uh, harass employers or to harass folks that are walking down the street because the federal government doesn't care. They don't want to know. Danbury is not a sanctuary city. We've never done that. Uh, if we pull you over and, and uh, uh, you're, uh, there's some question about your status, uh, we will report you to ICE. But that's immigration control enforcement. But ICE doesn't. They don't want to know because. They're too busy with serious crimes and tracking down those folks that are wanted with serious crimes. Now, if you're a person that says there shouldn't be any border security, there should be <coughs> any restriction on immigration, well, there's a, there's a price to pay for that. And in fact, just recently in Denver, we saw that. In the last month, we've got two people, one person that was wanted for murder in their own country, the second person uh, that was wanted for committing a series of rapes in their own country. So that's not good either. But you know, even the undocumented folks will tell you, we don't want criminals living among us. We don't want to know, you know, we, we want those people out of here too. It's not good for anybody. So uh, I think, you know, we have to be able to meet in the middle and find common ground and say that we need security, but we're also going to need some kind of plan. Uh, and in terms of local things to do, there's very little that, that the city can do except put pressure on Congress to do something, to address this problem in a meaningful manner. We've done it. I've been to Washington three times, twice in the last uh, four weeks. Uh, in fact, last Friday I met with Senator McCain in Hartford uh, related to this issue, and we spent about 45 minutes talking about his particular piece of legislation. Uh, and, um, and I talked to everybody all, all over the spectrum on this, this particular issue. And everybody's got a different opinion. I think that part of the problem of having Congress craft something that's going to work. One thing that the Senator did tell me is he doesn't expect Congress to actually pass a bill after the midterm elections because they're scared of this issue uh, just like everybody else. And uh, they don't want to deal with it probably until November. Right now, the Senate passed a bill uh, the other day, or the Judiciary Commission voted out a bill that's now uh, going to be debated in the Senate as what they call, uh, it will be raised as an amendment to a vehicle that uh, Senator Christ has that our first bill is, is more of an enforcement bill with a guest worker program in there. And then they're going to run this, the judiciary bill as an amendment. It's probably got the path bill the votes to pass. And then what happens is that bill has to get reconciled with the House bill, which was an enforcement only bill. And probably somewhere in the conference committee after the holidays or at least around uh, the holidays will be some kind of compromise bill that will be brought forward. But I also think that uh, 
uh, there are some things that can be done in the midterm, in the midtime, by putting pressure on people like your congresswoman, uh, like your two senators, like other senators and Congress people throughout the country to say, look, you know, this system's not, this is, there is no system, that's the problem, and we want you to deal with this in an effective and efficient manner. Um, so that's kind of uh, really where we are in this issue, and uh, uh, I actually said that I would answer some questions, and I've got a, one of our fire chiefs is leaving, uh, is retiring, so I've got to run over and present our proclamation to him. So you're going to get to talk, so you don't get any questions. <laughs> I'll get to you in a minute, but uh, at least go ahead. And let's be careful about the language we use. Mayor, how, if, if this bill goes through, we have uh, some kind of amnesty bill. How are you going to deal with the number of people, sheer number of people in this town that are living in block houses, 10, 15 to a single family home? Where are these people going to live that they're not uh, disobeying our zoning laws? And how are you going to deal with that? Well, that's uh, actually, there, you know, it's a good question. And just to, to kind of answer this, um, part of the problem of having uh, jobs that are underpaid, if you're paying, making 7 or $8 an hour, um, probably the job that you pay 11 or $12 an hour, it puts pressure on our housing stock, putting pressure on our housing stock, what we've seen is that we've had situations where we've had 20 or 30 people living under one roof. We, we actually shut down a house on Main Street where the basement, uh, they were renting our cost for five dollars a night. They had 25 people living in a room about this big, but only one form of egress, meaning that God forbid if there was a fire, somebody could get killed. And if somebody gets killed, and a lot of people get killed, you all aren't going to be sitting here saying, "What are you going to do about immigration?" You'll be coming to be saying, "Why didn't you do something about this, this horrible situation?" So there's a health and safety issue, particularly fire safety issue, that we're very concerned about with those kinds of concerns. And what we've done is we created an entire division of government that goes out and does specific uh, things related to enforcement. It's called the UNIT, the Unified Neighborhood Inspection Team. Uh, we, we go out and we first try to mediate disputes to neighborhoods. We also do inspections. Those inspections are published on our city website. You can read through them. Uh, if the uh, homeowner fails to comply, we then uh, bring into our city attorney who then uh, sues them and then eventually brings them into compliance. And the key to that is re-inspecting. So we go back uh, on an instrument basis. We don't tell people we're coming back, but we'll show up at night, we'll show up on Saturday to make sure, and it's usually absentee landlords that don't live in Danbury, that frankly don't care what, you know, what their house is uh, being done to their house, that are probably the biggest offenders. And we've been pretty successful at, at doing that. It will continue to be a problem. Uh, and I think that ultimately, it's, again, it's not our responsibility to find housing for every single person in the city. Obviously, people have to find it for themselves. But um, I think at the end of the day, the market will, will draw people to where they can afford housing and where there's an available amount of work. So we're working on that. We feel pretty comfortable um, where we are particularly going in the future. I just want to say one other thing, because if you're really interested in this issue, um, and I'm telling you question, if you're really interested in this issue, this is a, a copy of the uh, Jordan Report. The Jordan Report was done by Congresswoman Barbara Jordan in 1996. Um, it was commissioned in 1990. It took her seven years to write this report from a, uh, uh, from a congressional mandate. She had a budget. Uh, she probably spent about five or six million dollars preparing this report. It's very, very interesting reading uh, because there's some very interesting recommendations in here. One of the things that Congresswoman Jordan talks about is something called Americanization and integration. And she says it's critical for folks that have arrived uh, to the United States to, first of all, learn the, the <coughs> international business language of English. Everybody should learn English. And that's one of the things she spells out very clearly uh, in her uh, report. Uh, she also speaks to uh, that the federal government has no uh, best practices. They have no plan to integrate people. They don't encourage integration. And, and that this commission was very concerned about that and that in the long run that would have some impact uh, within our country. But it's a fascinating read. A lot of the issues that are discussed in here are things that we're struggling with right now. Uh, and she uh, certainly uh, did a really good job of this. And I actually met the, um, the media information person, the public relations person for this commission. Uh, I spent about an hour reviewing his findings with him. And Congress did use this to make some adjustments in 1996. They were pretty much paper kind of adjustments, nothing sweeping. But um, I've gone back and reread this several times, and there's just some really interesting uh, things in this report. It is on the internet, and I suggest you get a copy if you're really concerned about this issue. Because there's some good ideas and some, some good strategies in here. I'd like to 
J O R D A S. It's called uh, Becoming American Immigration and Immigrant Policy for the United States of America. Actually, the University of Texas has it online. And you can download it and read the executive summary. I found it fascinating. A lot of money was spent on that. Billy, you're going to have to cut you off so you can answer your question. Actually, this is my question to make more sense after I've been are you running off or are you going to be in the ground for a few minutes? Well, I'm good till um, 7 o'clock, unfortunately. Do you give me five minutes up before you go? Yeah. Done. Okay. Yes, sir. How are you doing, I'm Jesus. How are you doing? As you know, I try to bring uh, this issue down here before the city council a few times, and uh, I, I've been. Uh, Gerard? Yes. Nice to meet you face to face. Yeah. I, I, likewise. Uh, and I've been censored or whatever, nobody's letting me on the agenda. But the issue I want to bring up, first of all, I'm the son of an immigrant. My father is from Ireland. My wife's from Lithuania. And, uh, you know, I have nothing against immigrants. We have a problem here, obviously, in Denver, as we do in the rest of the country, where American citizens, jobs, are jobs and standard of living is being stolen by those that are here, illegal, illegal aliens. Uh, they are stealing the jobs not only from people like myself and the contractor, but people all across the workforce, including legal um, legal uh, legal uh, immigrants, and there's a slap in the face for them who have come here and done all the work properly, and then this is what th we allow this to happen. As you said yourself, the government is, uh, what kind of, a, of an answer is this when the government just doesn't want to enforce the law? Now, what I've been focusing on, and this is something that seems to be just written right over every time, is Title VIII, Section 1324, as it says in the city charter, any federal federally recognized code can be incorporated in the city charter. So. You know, you said before, well, you know, what are we going to do to harass contractors? And, of course, the answer is yes, that's the law. I, I, I want to know why, why local police, and the mayor has told us, he, he submitted a letter, I mean, the uh, chief of police has submitted a letter from the legal counsel that says you, in fact, can enforce the law locally without federal or state intervention, without the federal or state help. I want to know why Section 1324, which focuses on those that hire them, so you don't have to go and, uh, you know, do a, a SWAT team roundup. You can give summonses, make arrests, and give fines to those that are obviously uh, doing this right out in front of everyone's face. Now, if this was a uh, drug sales, we wouldn't be saying, well, you know, we, we can't do anything. We better go to Washington for help. If it's happening right here in front of everybody, they would all be rounded up. Now, I'm not even suggesting that you have to go down there and, and do a SWAT team, but just in, in response to citizens' complaints, make some arrests, make some fines, make some summonses, get somebody, because this is the law of the land. If we don't enforce the law, then I don't know what this, what's the sense of even talking about the issue. Right, well, here's the problem. Immigration and Control Enforcement is passing out a pamphlet right now telling you how to set up a day laborer center. That's your federal government. That's how they want the law enforced. They're giving out pamphlets saying, this is the best way to manage this problem. I agree with you. Okay, what so about on the local level? That, man, right that's, here. What, that's what they're doing to us. They're saying, don't arrest folks. Dude, you're, you're, don't, you don't have to. You have, to, you have the authority to make an arrest under federal and state law. Nobody's going to prosecute it. The, fed, the prosecutor's going to throw it out. That's the, the state of Connecticut can prosecute it. And, I, and I, I don't believe that. Because you know how many arrests? Absolutely not true. There's been four, there's been right. four arrests in the whole country right. in, the, in the last year. Right. So, I mean, right. how, does any, how is anyone going to do it unless somebody starts? That's, that's what I'm asking you to do. Okay. I, I heard you, and we're not doing it. Yes. Um, it's often uh, said uh, that uh, illegal immigrants are, are a drain on, the, on economics, uh, that it costs money. I wonder if there's ever been, uh, if you've ever attempted to quantify the economic benefits to Danbury that come to the economy through the storefronts that are occupied on Main Street that would be closed, sales taxes paid, uh, the economy that's generated by people working whether they're documented or not, providing services that despite what this gentleman says, uh, American citizens don't want to do, cleaning bedpans, washing cars. Has there ever been uh, an effort to uh, quantify that as, a, as a, a comparison to what you have uh, said right. as a drink? Let, let, let me just, uh, just say this. The argument that Americans don't want to do those jobs is really a spurious argument. Americans don't want to do those jobs because they only pay six or seven dollars an hour. Why do they only pay six or seven dollars an hour? Because there's such a, uh, a large supply of cheap manual labor. 
That's all the mark will bear. Right. But understand, you don't pay any less for the services provided to your house. That money is being pocketed by the people who own the businesses. They get people to work. So you pay a lot more for a head of lettuce if uh, the, uh, you know, the migrant I, workers yeah. were paid right. minimum wage. Yeah. You would be paying ten dollars for a head of lettuce. Correct, but that's what. But that's not what you said. You said Americans yeah. won't do them. They won't do them because the job doesn't pay ten dollars an hour. Right now, Americans and economically can. Well, Americans. Or we would all be broke. Well, Americans may want, you, we don't necessarily, I mean, you're big discourses, you know, but I want to say that Americans may, uh, maybe they want to pay more to understand that they have a secure country where we don't have people that My question was whether you've ever tried to quantify the economic benefits that have come to this country from immigrants. Right. Well, basically, the city, I right. well, basically, we see it two ways. One, that there is an economic benefit uh, to, to an entrepreneurial spirit that people have brought to the community that we find very positive. Um, but we also have to balance that against costs that are associated with hosting so many people who are undocumented. So there's, there, there would be a plus and minus sort of calculation you could come up with. We haven't developed a good mechanism, although the National Science Foundation has, and I suggest you read the report, because you'll find it's, it, it, they did it on a macro and national level, and they looked at benefits received versus taxes paid, and there was a large disparity in terms of weighted towards benefits received. But Locally, we haven't done that, but it's something that we've discussed to be able to quantify or come up with a number. But understand, once we do that, then everybody starts arguing about how you got to the number. Well, you use this for me, that for me. My point to that is, what's the point? The point is that everybody agrees the system doesn't work. Let's make Congress go do their job and come up with a system that does work, and then we don't have to worry about what the, what the impact is or what the quantify is. I mean, that's what we're about. Mr. Mayor, um, yes, and I, and I don't it is visible though, to the eye of the community that not just, you know, as you were mentioned, the Portuguese community who has been in Danbury for quite a while, the um, Brazilian community, the many nationalities within the Hispanic community, not only the monetary contributions that are saved, but also <coughs> the um, cultural contributions that we have made to the city, so much that now we're going to have an awesome magnet school. I mean, if, why would we have, we have magnet school if multiculturalism and having all these different nationalities were not such a positive thing for the Um My question to you is, do you feel in any way that the anti-immigration debate in Danbury has somewhat put into, uh, underneath the table the positive cultural contributions that the immigrant population has done? Not so much to talk about the monetary aspect now, but to talk about what made our Memorial Day parade for the first we have downtown Main Street, um, have to, for the Portuguese cultural center, have the freedom to also have their share of it. I mean, that's a cultural contribution that I cannot put a five price tag on it. And I've lived in Danbury mostly all my life, and that's what I'm proud of for being living in the city. Well, I think that Danbury has a tradition of celebrating our rich cultural heritage, and obviously. Uh, every, literally, starting in about another week or two, literally every weekend or every couple of weekends, we have another flag raising for another country. We just did St. Patty's Day where we raised the flag of Ireland, play the Irish National Anthem. We do Columbus Day, we do Greek National uh, Holiday, we'll do um, Brazilian Day, Portuguese Day. Uh, pretty much we, we pride ourselves in our, in our, our rich uh, ethnic heritage and our rich cultural heritage, and that is something to be worn with honor. And in fact, it, I don't think, though, that uh, you can you have to separate the people from the policy. The bottom line is that the federal policy towards uh, illegal immigration does not work. It's failed. But that doesn't mean that people are bad. And you have to separate the two. And I don't think people, people get so emotional about this issue that they automatically think it's about me and it's about who I am. And it's, and it's not about that. It's about a failed policy that doesn't work. And we have to focus in on that and understand that what moves mountains is not Mayor Bowden here. Because I'm already telling them to fix it. It's you telling them to fix it that whatever the system is, it's not working. That's how you do it. So let me add it again. Lionel? My name is Lionel Villavicencio. And, um, I want to ask you. Uh, Can you speak up? Yeah, please. We have here to go back there. Can you hear? Speak up. Okay. Can we go to the microphone, Lionel? No. <laughs> That's okay. Um, my question is this. Why? They blame the immigrant for the economy fell. Why is the other company moving to another country? Like in, like a GM already saying going bankruptcy. Why blaming the immigrant? 
the draining the job from the American people. They pay more for another country for cheaper labor. Well, let me just say this: labor jobs will go where labor is cheap. I mean, that's the result of NAFTA. That's a large macro issue. So uh, what Congress didn't do when they passed NAFTA was say, listen, Mexico, Canada, wherever, you have to obey the same environmental rules that we have to, and you've got to pay the same, same living wage that the US does if you want to uh, be able to export your products and goods and services. And there was a way we could have imposed that on other countries so that, for example, we, if you call your American Express bill, somebody in Pakistan doesn't pick up, somebody in maybe the Milford would pick up. And, but we didn't do that. And that was a, a, an unintended consequence of that trade agreement that Congress passed in 1993 or 94, I don't know what it was. So what happened is, is that cheap job laborers will go where labor is cheap. I mean, that's, that is what the market will determine. So GM will move, and uh, manufacturing jobs will move uh, to wherever they can get their product made the cheapest. Now the next, next new horizon, the next new world is China. And China is, uh, making things faster, quicker, and cheaper than any of us can possibly imagine. And they are the next economic giant on the horizon. They will be the Japan of the 21st century with a billion people behind them. So um, I think that um, that issue uh, is a problem. But you know, somebody touched on it, and this is an issue. And it's an issue, again, because the system is broken. Where I've had landscapers come into my office in tears. They've had to sell all their equipment because they can't compete with the pricing structure that people that have come here that aren't paying workman's comp, they're not paying withholding, they're not paying social security, they're not paying uh, some of those other fees that go into running a business. And they've had to give up their business and get out of the business entirely because they just can't compete. So there, there is an issue there. But then there's also a discussion about, well, some people are willing to work harder, longer, and faster for less money to get ahead. And you know, certainly people can make that decision, um, particularly when you come from a region or an area where there is no opportunity and there is no economics. So what you're saying is, is, is the, the drain of the job in the United States is no immigrant fault. It's because they're moving to cheaper labels in another country. Well, I think what we're saying is that this discussion is not about immigrants. This discussion is about the policy of illegal immigration. And those two are separate. I think, you know, I'm going to tell you that we need, I, I can only speak for myself, but in the city, I'm saying we need immigrants. We need legal immigration. It's, it's, it's determined that we're going to have to have some system that, that people have to get here. However, the system has to be legal, and that's the operative word here. And, that, and by not doing that, it short circuits the whole, the whole system. Yes, yes sir. Let's address the question of the head of lettuce. Uh, that uh, Charlie mentioned. Number one, the people uh, that uh, make the profit from the lettuce uh, is agribusiness. Yeah. It's not the consumer. Absolutely. If you go to the supermarket, you pay the, same the price. price of lettuce is very high. Uh, what else do they say? Mm. Uh, yes, illegals cost more in services then they pay in taxes. Yes. And there's a higher percentage of illegals on poverty than uh, foreign <coughs> immigrants or uh, other uh, citizens. So these are, these are parts of the things that have to be addressed. Well, let me just say that um, there aren't a lot of good definitive studies out there about uh, the cost of illegal immigration because people are undocumented aren't counted. So it's hard to define and to, and, to, and to be definitive about what those numbers are. The only study I can refer you to is the National Science Foundation that did one, and that was done about the federal government. It didn't have any state, county, or local component to it. Um, it would be certainly something to interest to balance off both sides of the equation and see exactly where those numbers worked out and how they worked out. Regardless, you have to be into the system. I don't think you can ultimately sustain a country where the rule of law is not enforced. I mean, ultimately, that's where we have to get to, is that we have laws that are workable and that are enforceable. I refer you to the uh, Committee on Immigration Research. The, the uh, new CIR you find that on the, on the uh, I've internet. Seen it. I've seen they it. come closest with reliable figures. It's true. You can't pinpoint people who are in the shadows, but you can make uh, solid estimates of the effect. Sure. Yes, ma'am. 
Thank you. Mayor Brown, I was wondering, um, what do you think can be done to diminish the behaviors associated with possibly the hate and the anger toward um, immigrants, um, more specifically, you know, maybe people of color or people with accents? The reason I ask this is maybe no one in here has experienced that, but, um, you know, just sometimes I go to Kennedy Park with my daughter when the weather is nice, and there are a lot of hateful remarks out the windows and stuff like that. And also, a friend of mine, um, an older woman, her daughter was going to Spain, and she was studying, and they were, I guess, practicing Spanish together down Main Street in Danbury, and a lot of hateful remarks were made. So I was wondering, what do you think can, can be done? I know you can't ever stop people's thoughts or words, but in terms of behavior, so. Well, I, look, I don't think that anybody condones uh, any kind of behavior uh, that belittles or demeans somebody because of the ethnicity of their accent. I think that um, you have to be very careful in this discussion so it doesn't devolve into them because this does not give license to people to go out and do those things. The fact of the matter is that people are here, regardless of their status, they're human beings, and we ought to be humanitarians and treat each other with compassion and care. Does that happen all the time? No. Is that a bad thing? Of course it is. And certainly, uh, I would, and I started this discussion in the middle, I'm not going to stand here if this discussion devolved into that because I just, I just won't condone it. So uh, I think we have to be able to send that message that, look, there has to be some revision to the law, but this is about a policy. It's not about people. We have to separate the two and recognize that it's not about immigrants because we're a nation of immigrants. We're also a nation of law, and we have to develop laws that are enforceable and that we can we can follow. It's just unfortunate, just a comment, because many people are scared, documented or not, people with accents or people of color. So it's just unfortunate for me. So I just want to say that. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. Yes, ma'am. Mayor Dalton, um, I'm a newcomer to this community, and I moved here because of its diversity. I can raise my son in a racist community, and I'm deeply concerned with the way this immigration debate has become has this racist overtones. I have worked for 10 years in many different diverse communities, all of them with similar demographics to Danbury. And this is the first time I have ever encountered such racist remarks made towards me. And I think that you can't ignore this issue in your community. I think there needs to be some kind of procedure in place and to, to address the racism that is associated with mm -hmm. this debate. Well, first of all, let me go. Let me thank you for, for having the strength to make those comments, but there is a procedure. If somebody makes hateful comments to you, we have a, a, you know, hate crimes laws that are on the books that are clear. You should file a complaint with the local police department, and we would follow up on that. We certainly don't condone that kind of activity. But you're, what you're suggesting, I, I, I disagree with in the sense of this. You're suggesting that we can't have this discussion because it just becomes racist. No, I'm not suggesting Okay, all right, so, so if we start with that premise and say that this discussion is not about racism, it's not about ethnicity, and it's not about the way somebody looks, but it is about a failed policy that does not work, then we, we should be able to, a progressive community, a rational community, and a compassionate community, should be able to have this discussion. Actually, that's what I'm concerned about. Of course you should be able to have a discussion on immigration. What I am concerned about is that the discussion on immigration has led to racist overtones in the community. The, that is what I'm concerned right. about. And, and I would say those people that use those overtones don't belong at the table for the discussion. They don't, they're not part of who we are as a community. And we should rebuke them and say, look, you just, you're just you not going to sit here and have, make those comments because we don't agree with it. I don't agree with it. Just like the people who are way off on the other side saying there's no problem, what are you crazy? You know, they don't belong at the, at the discussion table either. This, this, this discussion has to happen in the middle where about 65% of Americans are. And the fringe elements just can't participate. I agree. Um, I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt. Uh, in fairness to our main speaker, and also in fairness to the mayor, he's got another appointment at 7 o'clock. So there's just one more question. We'll take one last question, and then the mayor will ask Mayor, I just want to make a comment. I, I received a racist telephone call from a person who has an accent. So this is not a one-sided situation. 
this is also racism on the other side of the coin. Well, I, 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 let me just say this, Louise. Nobody, first of all, we, we really got to work towards not having size and recognize that there's an issue that needs to be fixed. And, and how that gets fixed is what those wonderful people in Washington get paid to do. We have to recognize that and push them to do their job. Like us beating up on each other, we're not solving anything but just creating a situation where they get to walk away and not deal with a difficult issue because they're afraid of it. So what we have to do is recognize that that's where this discussion really needs to happen. And we have to make them have the discussion, not put off debate like they did today for another two weeks because they know that the Senate is afraid just to talk about it. They don't even want to talk about it. Just your hands one foundation. suggestion with regard to all of this. I read the Danbury News Times every day. There's your mistake. I find it to be very inflammatory. And I don't know. They if look if for you, that stuff. I don't they know do. if you want to be represented by the newspaper that way, or if you want your city to be represented by the newspaper that way. But that's where a lot of this energy is coming from, from my opinion. I read that stuff. And I'm like, whoa, I mean, what, is this a local newspaper or is this some national right. junk sheet? And I think that is a source, a major source of, of the issue here, problems. The problem. Yes, yes. yes. Well, it, look, it sells papers. You can, they and know you, that, but you right. do have, they quote you a lot. They don't, yeah, not accurately, but. <laughs> they speak except, to you a lot. You speak for a long time. But uh, look, I, I, I got to take care of my fire chief, I'm sorry, but uh, not our big fire chief, it's an assistant chief, but. And, and I got a proclamation to read to him, so I'm going to have to uh, slip out of here. But you know, let me just say, let me just, I'm going to leave you with one story because it's a true story, man. And, and, and maybe it'll help us bring things back into perspective a little bit. The other morning, um, just about two weeks, three weeks ago, I got a phone call at like five o'clock in the morning. Now I'm an early riser, so it was okay, no problem. And um, I pick up the phone, and it was a friend of mine, and her name is Fabian. And she calls me Mr. Mark. I don't know why she told her to call me Mark a hundred times, and she calls me Mr. Mark. She says, Mr. Mark. I go, Fabian, did you realize it's 5 a.m.? She goes, I do. And I said, well, I'm really kind of sleeping, and my wife's probably not happy that I'm talking on the phone to, to, to somebody at 5 o'clock in the morning. And she says, well, you got to help me. you got to help me. I said, okay, what's the problem? She said, who is the vice president? I go, the vice president is Dick Cheney. And I waited a few minutes. And she goes, I, who's my congresswoman? I said, your congresswoman is Nancy Johnson. She goes, now give me two other congresspeople in Connecticut. I go, oh, I'm in my bed. I go, Chris Shays, uh, Rob Simmons, Rosa DeLauro. So she's writing them all down. Here, you know, I just spell them R, O, B. I go, okay. So finally, after about the fourth question of all these sort of like government questions, I go, time out. I go, Fabian, oh, what's this all about? You know, what are you doing? And she says, well, she says at 11 o'clock this morning, I go to take my citizenship test. <coughs> and I says, okay. So I stayed on the phone with her another half an hour, and she had the flashcards. They give you flashcards when you take this test, and you have to remember what's on the flashcards. And her daughter fell asleep all night trying to, you know, quiz her, so she wanted somebody to stay up with her and, and answer the questions back and forth to her. So I said, that's great, Fabian. I said, will you tell me what happens? You know, call me at the end of, at the, end of the day, let me know what happens. Well, at one o'clock, she called me up. She, she was crying with, with joy. She had just become a United States citizen. And so I think we have to remember that's what it's really all about. And of course, I brought it out to get registered to vote right away. But, um, well, no, we didn't make it work. But I can't tell you what, 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 how exciting it was to see somebody become a citizen. So let's try to keep things in perspective and remember what this discussion is all about. So thank you very much. Again, I want to thank the mayor for having asked four key questions. And if we answer these questions, I believe that solutions are going to suggest themselves. And some approaches that have been tried may seem less attractive. The mayor asked these four questions. What are the laws? Why are the laws as they are? How did we get here, and what do we need to do from here? Did the mayor leave already? Okay, there we go. Great. I, I, I deeply regret, Mayor Bowden, that you're not going to be able to be here for the talk, because I would much prefer to ask the questions at the end of the talk, but I know, I know that you have to get going. Um, I, guess, I, I guess 
I think the mayor understands this, but I think most Americans have no clue about the following two or three facts that I'm going to discuss at Berlin in my talk. Other than the 5,000 agricultural visas that are available each year for people to come and pick tomatoes, prune apple trees, etc., etc., and there are I mean, numerous studies that show we actually need more like 20 to 50,000 of those visas per year. But other than those, if you will, lowest level kinds of jobs, and the 60 to 110,000 high tech kinds of visas, people with people with expertise in medicine, in computers, with doctorate degrees, and master's degrees, and bachelor's degrees. There are no visas for all the jobs in the middle. There are no visas for busboys, no visas for waiters, no visas for cooks, no visas for dishwashers, no visas for babysitters, no visas for people cutting your lawn, no visas for people taking care of our elderly. In other words, there is no legal way to come and do those jobs. Now, if you hold on to that fact for a moment, and you add it to another fact, I think things might become clearer in this debate. Now, Ross Perot talked about this, this loud sucking sound, sucking sound back in the 92 election, was it? about, you know, south of the border, there's this sucking sound that's just going to take our jobs out of the United States. Well, right now, there is a reverse sucking sound going on. And there's a vacuum cleaner in the United States pointed south of the border, sucking labor into the United States because we have an aging population and we have hundreds of thousands of jobs that need to be filled. Now, the mayor made an interesting point. He said, you know, if we paid enough money, if we paid $10 an hour to pick lettuce, Americans would do it. Well, I want to tell you the, the story of the Guatemalan stone wall. The story of the Guatemalan stone wall is that somebody in Stanford, my hometown, wanted to build a stone wall, and they got in uh, several contractors. And the first couple contractors were immigrants from the last wave of immigration, Italians and, and Eastern Europeans and, and whatever. And they gave them estimates all around, well, uh, converging on $40,000 to build stone wall for He then somehow just, you know, I guess he saw a couple trucks passing by, you know, Jose's masonry or Frederico's masonry, whatever, he called them over. And they gave him an estimate, and he said, you know, $40,000, way too much. I am not, decision, I am not going to build a stone wall. Later on, he saw some other masons, and, you know, he was just asking them because he really lost interest in the whole thing. And he had him come over, and they said, we'll build a stone wall for you for $20,000. And he decided to build the stone wall. So what happens is, on the one hand, immigrants are taking a certain amount of jobs and lowering wages a certain amount. But on the other hand, there are many things that get done that would otherwise not get done. In other words, if you have 100 people who want a stone wall, and only 30 of them are going to shell out $40,000, but 60 or more of them will shell out $20,000 to build that stone wall, the economy wins. So the other point I want you to know is it is impossible to come here legally. Therefore, people come by lying at the consulate and getting a visitor visa and working, which they're not supposed to do. That's the 60% Mayor Bowden told us about. And then there's the other 40% who are more honest Salt of the earth folks who aren't going to lie at the consulate, they just honestly cross the border to do the job. And the problem with, for those two groups of people is, once they do that, for all practical purposes, there is no way for the rest of their lives they could ever legalize. I get hundreds of calls a day as an immigration attorney. Nah, that's an exaggeration. I get 40 or 50 calls a day. I do get 40 or 50 calls a day. And nine out of 10 people calling me about immigration, and by the way, as much as I charge for a green card, for a work permit, when I can do it for somebody, and that's the point of getting to, as much as I charge, my wife says, Phil, why, why do you do immigration? You work four times as hard, you make half the money of one single automobile accident case. Phil, if you just did automobile accident, if you just took a few more automobile accident cases, 
You could forget about immigration. You wouldn't be going nuts, David versus Goliath, against the federal government trying to help this poor guy who's gotten into trouble. And you'd make more money and you'd spend more time with us. Well, that's another discussion. <laughs> the point is that nine out of 10 people calling me in my office, there is nothing in God's green earth I can do for them. Because we have catch 22s and vicious circles all over the place in immigration. One of the most famous vicious circles is if you're illegally here, for the most part, most people, not all people, there are certain important exceptions, if you're illegally here to get a green card, you have to leave the United States and present yourself to the US consulate back in your home country, be that Paris, London, Berlin, Guatemala City, or Port-au-Prince. But there's another law that says once you've been here more than a year illegally, if you leave the United States for any reason under the sun, including to get a, a green card, you cannot come back for 10 years. Which means you can't get a green card. Good. Now, Mayor Bowden, you seem like a very nice guy tonight. It's the first time I've ever met you. But I feel, and, and now I'm not talking about the law, I'm just gonna, I wanted to wrap up with this, but you're leaving this one. I feel that what cities like Danbury should be doing is recognizing the complete paralysis in Washington on this issue. They haven't done anything good, they haven't done anything bad, they haven't done a darn thing, they just let a bad situation, bad for everybody, linger and fester and, and just be bad. I don't think there's a person in this room who disagrees with that. But I think that what cities like Danbury and states like Connecticut should be doing is saying, we're not gonna deport these 11 million people, eventually, you know, they're going to either legalize or die, and their offspring will, of course, be U.S. citizens. So we should be reaching, since the federal government is not doing its job, we need to recognize they're here, they're staying, the ones who are not criminals, they're staying. He said it, he said, 11 million people, we can't possibly deport them all. As a matter of fact, we'll go bankrupt trying. They're staying. So what we are going to do is we are going to offer them classes on integration and assimilation. We are not going to let them get ripped off. You have family after family in Stanford and no doubt in Danbury too that goes to the real estate agent and says, we've been working as bus boys for five years. We've saved up 30,000. We're ready to buy a house. And they show up houses and they say, well, this house is a little bit beyond you know, what I can afford. And the real estate agent rips them off. The real estate agent says, you can rent the basement. You can rent the attic. The mortgage broker says, don't worry about it. They don't enforce those laws. And somebody else says, just put drapes over the window. <laughs> <laughs> <That's what> <laughs> Somebody's radioactive over <laughs> Somebody's radioactive over Oh, so stay over here. Okay. And, and, and these people are from countries where you don't have zoning laws. Or there's stuff on the books, but it never gets enforced. Or if you slip somebody 100 bucks, which, by the way, has happened in Connecticut from time to time, the DMV most specifically very recently, and the building departments all over the state at one time or another have had people go to jail for, for, for accepting bribes, for letting violations pass. They are getting ripped off. And what I want to see cities like Danbury and Stanford and New Haven do is reach out to the immigrants and teach them what our laws are and provide classes in English. I have never met an English, uh, in English. <laughs> I would, I've never met an immigrant who wouldn't plop $2,000 cash on the table, $5,000, $10,000 cash to be able to speak English. No, I just want to interrupt you when you say that. All you do is go upstairs and look at our computer lab and know that this city spends tens of thousands of dollars teaching English for free. Thank you, Mark. We don't, we, now, I just want to say that because you're not aware of that, obviously. And uh, we invest in those kinds of things specifically to help people assimilate in their, the Americanization process. And we've hosted meetings where we've taught people just one last call and one tomorrow night uh, or in Spanish about what our zoning laws are, how you get a permit, how you do this. And last night, I was at a meeting for our biz, small business owners, a 10-week program put on by the City of Danbury, the Chamber, and the Yukon Greater uh, Small Business Development Center, all for free, all in Spanish, to teach people how to go about doing all those very things. So we are, that's, part, that's the second part of what we do. That's, that's a which, perfect introduction to my question. Which is, is to manage both those things. I, I know you have to run, and thank you for that remark, because this, this is my question. 
Local police are in charge of enforcement of criminal law. Coming here, being here, and working here without authorization are not crimes. They are violations of law, but they are not crimes. They are civil violations. Look it up in the book. They are civil violations. They are just like a parking ticket is a civil violation. Paying your taxes late is a civil violation, etc., etc., etc. Local police are in charge of enforcing criminal laws. So my question for you, Mr. Bowden, is do you regret having suggested that local police should be deputized to go after civil immigration violators? And do you now repudiate this, this, uh, this effort that you made, which I believe drove a wedge between the immigrant community, the law enforcement community, and the rest of the community. The, the answer to your question is no and no. And let me tell you why. A Section 133 agreement is not designed for mass roundups. It's not designed for deportation. It's designed to have local police assist with state police and assist the federal immigration control enforcement agents to find people that are wanted for crimes both in the United States and outside the United States and put them back into the immigration system. That's how it's used in Florida, Alabama, uh, California, uh, and throughout the other states and, and municipalities that have engaged in that particular program. Now, but I you see, never said we want, uh, we only want the police yeah, to go after the criminals. No, I kind of did. Or the, well, well, hold it, that's the key word, kind of. Yeah, I know, kinda. I did. Hold well, you, on. No. That's my whole beef with you, Mayor Brown. No, no, is you, you never you, say, I want to pick on the 1% of un no. undocumented who are criminals, and the other 99%, as long as they keep their nose clean, pay their taxes, and do what they're supposed to do, are welcome here in my state. No, not if they're illegal. No way. No way. Not if they're illegal. Bill, that's not, that is not what, that is not, you heard what you wanted to hear, because let's be honest, you make money by getting people legal. That's your business. It's not about getting, you love 40 phone calls. I didn't, I didn't think we were going to get personal. Well, but you, you kind of are, so you can't sit there and throw out a personal thing and say, but, but, you know, you drove a wedge and, and all these other things, and then turn around and say, but I have nothing to do with that. The reality is, is that that program is used in that manner, and obviously, other states are doing it, they're doing it successfully. And by the way... So, so let's make it clear. Are you saying that the 99.9% .9 or whatever the figure is of undocumented immigrants who are otherwise keeping their nose clean and would legalize if there was any way on God's green earth they could, are they welcome in Danbury or not? No. Yeah, I'm asking you, no Mayor Bowden, are I they answer. welcome I or answer. not? Are they welcome no. or no. not? Let him speak. Sir. Let him speak. No, Speak, then you know, if you're going to stand up there and proselytize, I'm going to leave. I'm not going to sit here and get a debate with you. The reality is, is that people are here, however, they got here. We have a responsibility to make sure that the health, safety, and welfare for all the Americans is protected, and that's what I do every day. That's my job. So, that's the reality. So, the question, yes, so, no, no. The, the question is that they're here. It's not even an issue whether they're welcome or not. There's nothing that if anybody wanted to. We answer, the, we answer the question every day, every day by the actions of the city government. Every day. Whether it's small business development, whether it's English, free English classes, whatever it's done. If I felt that people weren't welcome, I would cut off funding to the Hispanic Center. I, I, think, I, I hope the headline in the news time, yeah. which misses the point most of the time, reads, yeah. Mayor refuses yeah. to welcome hard working immigrants dying to legalize. I'm ready to talk whenever. Again, I want to thank the mayor for asking, I think, a few questions. What are the laws? Why are they like that? How did we get here? And what do we need to do about it? I think I've told you my most important point. That there is no way for people to come legally to this country to do the vast majority of jobs we need for them to do. Once they get here, there's no way for them to legalize, for the most part. I mean, you know, the law is the law, and there's little, little wiggles and exceptions here and there throughout the whole system. But for the most part, once they get here, once they lie to get the visa, and then come to visit their Aunt Matilda, but then they really go and show up for the first
first day of work three days later as a busboy clearing your dishes from your meal at the restaurant that costs a buck or two less because they're there, there's no way for them to legalize. So I think... Was there ever a way? Have the laws changed? All right, the question is, was there ever a way? Yes. Remember I said there's the catch-22. Uh, if you're here illegally, for the most part, you've got to understand everything I'm telling you. All right? Uh, 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 we're going to give this side of the room a real chuckle here. Uh, everyone who thinks, you know, everyone wants to be deported the rest of it. I'm going to give you a real chuckle because everything I'm telling you tonight is at least partly, with your seatbelt on, a lie. Mm -hmm. Because everything I tell you has certain exceptions. So when I say, this is the law, what I'm saying is, 90% of the time, or 95% of the time, or 80% of the time, this is the law. So, so with that proviso, okay, for people who are illegally here, the vast majority of them, there's no way for them to legalize here in the United States. In order for them to legalize, they need an employer or a family member to sponsor them. Okay, it has to be a qualifying family member or a qualifying employer who can show that he's advertised, look for citizens, look for legal. Uh, immigrants and then is turning to either an undocumented immigrant here in the United States or an immigrant back in the home country. But the problem with that system is how does that immigrant know that this employer is looking? How does this employer know that immigrant? And then are they going to wait five years to get a on their first date? Okay. So here's this law that says if you are illegally here and you have a family member or, or uh, an employer who's willing to sponsor you, you have to leave to go back to the United States. And then the other law says if you've been here more than a year illegally, or in a, you know, undocumented, if you came and your documents expired, or you came and never had documents, you cannot come back for 10 years. That law was passed in 1996. The law about you have to leave has been, around, been on the books since 1953, the last major revision of the immigration law. Uh, anybody here have or know somebody who owns a car from 1953? All right, it doesn't run so good. And that's part of the problem with our immigration laws and how we got where we got. That's why the laws are the way they are. We have this huge revision in 1953, and then small and moderate uh, revisions and amendments thereafter. And it almost looks like, you know, the glacier came this way, a hurricane went that way, a typhoon went this way, and, 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 and there's all these changes in, and you can point to different parts of the immigration statutes that are completely contradictory, where it says white versus black, right, left versus right, up versus down. And as an immigration attorney, there's a famous quote uh, that if you can find an immigration attorney who can work their way through the system for you, you have found a nugget of gold and you should hang on to them for all dear life. It is the most complicated area of the law in all of American jurisprudence, comparable to tax law. And the thing about tax law is, the more money you have, the more sophisticated help you need, the more, but the more money you have to pay for sophisticated help. Whereas with immigration, uh, the poorer you are, the more complex your case seems to be, and the less you're able to afford competent help. So people end up in the hands of notarios, which is the Spanish word for notaries. By the way, if anybody here wants a quick get rich scheme, get your pen ready, or your pencil, here it is. Get yourself, get yourself a notary license. Uh-oh, radioactive. Get yourself a notary license and rent a store in downtown Danbury or Stanford or any other, any other city in the country and put up a sign in the window, a foot high letters, Notario. Again, that's the word for notary in Spanish. Because in half the, Latin, half the Spanish speaking countries, a notario is like a super lawyer. If you want to fool around, you go to the abogado, the attorney. If you want to get stuff done, you go to the notario. And people are doing that. <coughs> Danbury is famous among Connecticut immigration lawyers for having the highest concentration of notarios ripping people off, putting in applications that are invalid, and getting them into deportation proceedings, and, and misleading people, and, mis and promising results. As an attorney, I never promise results. I promise I'll try real hard, but even the best case only has a 97% chance of success. And people freak out when I tell them, and I say, sorry. You know, life is uncertain, the law is more uncertain, and immigration law is really uncertain, and that's just the way it is. Um, so if you want to get rich, screen, get rich quick scheme, just put up the word notario and tell people, as these people do, don't worry, pal, you know, my cousin works in immigration, or don't worry, you know, my uncle works for uh, IRS and we'll take care of you real good. Because that's code language in those countries for if you slip me an extra 100 or 200, it's going to go like grease lightning. Can I take you? Sorry.
want to know what is the I-9? All right, the I-9, uh, if you've applied for a job since 1986-87, there's a form you have to fill out uh, and you, that says, I am a citizen or I'm a legal permanent resident, which is fancy talk for a green card holder, or, uh, or I have a work permit or other. Um, and you're supposed to provide some sort of proof of, that, of your uh, authorization to work, which would be um, uh, a social security number, and I think proof of your ID or proof of your immigration status or something like that. And employers are required to fill this out. If you don't do it, there's something like a thousand dollar or three thousand dollar fine or something like that for not doing it. Uh, this was, you know, the, the back back in the 1986 amnesty. The idea was let's legalize all these people, and from now on we're going to hit the employers hard when they employ people who don't have papers to work. And in fact, they did hit it hard for a while, but then they backed up. And as somebody pointed out earlier, last year, in the entire United States, of whatever that is, 20 million employers, with you know probably about 5 million of them employing uh, undocumented immigrants in one form or another, only three were hit with fines for uh, hiring people either without filling out I-9s or, or accepting fraudulent documents or knowingly hiring people who don't have immigration status. Did I answer your question about the I-9? Okay. Questions about the law today? Yes. Yeah, uh, I'm glad to have a lawyer here. And can you explain to us this paper gave to us now the two steps for immigration law? There? Okay, good. Each, well, each act, what that means? Yeah, yes, I, I right. believe I have one, two, three, four, yep. four five acts. Right. Can you explain to us each one? Okay. But for us, he doesn't know which, law, which right, act my, means. I want to answer your question. I want to tell you what all those four pieces of legislation are. Uh, but I was talking right now about what the laws are today and how they got how they got that way. This is more about the very next topic that I'm going to talk about starting in five minutes or two minutes or more right now if people are finished with those questions. What laws are out there today? Any questions about what the law existing law is today? Yes, sir. I'm going to train myself down to much immigration law, but two questions. There's no such thing as you either do immigration law with both of you or you don't do it at all. Well, I, I do. I do citizenship only for the most part. But my question is, is the immigration lottery going to be eliminated? And second of all, if you are uh, uh, without documentation, but you say married American citizen, can you always adjust your status in this country? Or is there any certain that we have to go back to okay. the country? Uh, question number one, uh, the visa lottery. Uh, I can't remember when they did it, 1970, 1980. Congress actually created a lottery where you could win a green card. All right? uh, there were 50, 000, 50 or 55,000 of them available, and I think there's like 30 million people who apply every year. If you are undocumented in the United States, you cannot apply. So even if you apply, well, actually you can apply, and you can win, but you can't collect, because to collect you have to leave. If you leave, you can't come back for 10 years. That didn't apply to many countries. Only and also, also, there's a list of like 20 countries where they say there's already many immigrants from those countries, and it's called the diversity visa lottery because we don't have very, very many Nepalese immigrants, and this is to bring in Nepalese so we can get the benefit of that diversity. The second question: well, is uh, the if be eliminated? I have no idea. Uh, sorry, not big on my radar screen. It's it's a it's candy. Um, the second question is. Uh, let's say Wilson, who is a bona fide naturalized U.S. citizen, he took the test and speaks English and all the rest of it. Let's say he is an undocumented immigrant. And he marries, what is your name? Seneca Swarovski. He marries Seneca Swarovski, who is a United States citizen. The question is, can he get a green card? And the answer is, maybe yes, maybe no. And in many situations, uh, even if George, and I tell this to my clients, and, and they don't believe me, and they wander off to another lawyer, and they finally end up in the clutches of either an unethical, unethical attorney, get an interactive lawyer, right? uh, they either end up in the hands of an unethical attorney or a notario who says, don't worry, we can do your papers, and the worst thing you can do is apply for something if you don't qualify, because then you do get an order of deportation. When you get an order of deportation, now you are, a, that is a criminal violation. You, know, you didn't show up in court, now, now you've got a warrant out for your arrest and you're a fugitive of the law. And if the local cops pick you up, they can and will hold you and immigration can and will come pick you up. That is their, their immigration's priorities are not, you know, the guys in Kennedy Park or the, or the bus boy or the waiter. Their priorities are the ones who committed cr violent crimes, drug-related crimes, uh, people with, and people with outstanding deportation orders. Well, of course, terrorism goes without saying, all right? So, 
There are many times when I have to explain to somebody, you marry, even if George and Laura Bush divorce, and you marry Laura Bush, there is a very good, I'm exaggerating, but I'm trying to get the point through to people who are, tend to be a, well, I won't say I'm sophisticated, they have a whole cross-cultural barrier. They come from countries, they hold different instinct, a way of thinking things, just like every other immigrant group before them, okay? As a matter of fact, another one of the points that I like to make is, no immigrant wave to the United States has ever integrated in the first generation. And when we say, well, my parents learned English, what we're really doing is forgetting what really happened back then, which was they were the architects and engineers and doctors back in Ireland and Italy and Poland were waiting tables and washing toilets and doing other stuff and treated badly and never really learned English very well. Some of them did, but most of them kept on reading Polish newspapers here in the United States and drove the Americans nuts. There are some exceptions, though. <laughs> As I said, 10% of them learned English well. <laughs> Now, so I'm in the situation of saying, you married Laura Bush, now you have to leave the country, and you have to ask for a pardon to come in. It's gonna take you two years to find out if you got the pardon or not. During those two years, your wife and family are starving and getting kicked out of their house and onto the street. There's no breadwinner in the house. And at the end of those two years, there's a third, one third chance that you will not get the pardon and you will be stuck out of the United States for the next 10 years. We have inhumane, broken immigration laws. I'm ready to talk about what proposals are uh, in Congress in Washington right now. I also want to talk about a couple proposals in Hartford right now. Any questions about today's immigration law before I move on? Well, I'll either bored you or stultify you or put you to sleep. Huh? Which one is it? All right. All right, so let's talk about the proposals. You have, I think everybody has this handout right here saying call the president, call your senators, call your state representative. I think, you know, if everybody did that, people who love immigrants, people who hate immigrants, people who love the law, people who hate the law, people who want people deported, people, you know, I think democracy would be better. Because that's what democracy is all about. And that's why a lot of immigrants are coming here so they can have that freedom that they didn't have back in their home country. So, it talks, it, I mentioned here, right where my thumb is on this piece of paper, the DREAM Act. The DREAM Act is a law, is a is legislation that recognizes that there are hundreds of thousands of immigrants, undocumented immigrants living in the United States who are Americanized in every way, shape, and form. They were brought to this country by their parents when they were 14 and 10 and 6 years old. They grew up in the United States. They eat pizza. They wear clothes with holes in them or whatever it is kids are doing these days. They talk American, think American, feel American, and a lot of them are getting straight A's in school. And at the age of 17, 18, when it's time to apply for college, their parents break some really bad news on them. Not only are you not a citizen, you're not even legal, and you're deportable. This legislation will permit kids who came here before the age of 16 or 17 who've been here for five years and have in all the intents and purposes become Americanized to not have need a family member or an employer to sponsor them, not need to leave and trigger the 10-year bar and be unable to return. They will be able to self-sponsor themselves and get themselves a green card and move on with their American lives. That's what the Dream Act is. Questions about Dream Act? Yes, sir. How would that help limit the amount of illegal immigrants coming to this country? Would I, that encourage more people to sneak into this country with their children so their children can become American citizens? You know, I, I think someone who's going to come here and live under live underground for five years and wait for their kids to reach the right age and then apply for it, and, and especially if we start creating visas for these people to come legally. All of a sudden, that's going to be a huge disincentive for people to lie to get visitor visas and stay and work. It's going to be a huge disincentive for people across the border to come to these jobs. And all of a sudden, you know, we're going to go from whatever it is, 1,000 or 10,000 people crossing the border every night, to one or 200, and those are going to tend to be the really bad guys, the guys who can't get this intermediate work visa. The drug runners, the, 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 the gun runners, the those guys, traders. Those guys scare me as bad as they can scare anybody. There's some bad news stuff going on at the border. However, 99 point whatever percent of the percent of them 
have nothing to do with that. Where did you come up with that number of 99 point some percent? Well, I mean, you know, in any population, how many are criminals? How well, many are part of the criminals? One handout that's going around says 6% or 7% of the prisoners in the federal and state prisons are illegals. Uh, I'm trying to think. Well, but you understand that the working population in the United States, people of working age, 5% of the American workforce today is undocumented immigrants. Which but means if you deport them. But which, you just which, said 99.9%, and I'm looking at this, and it's saying at least 6 or 7%. Well, are, are in jail now. That's not the ones that haven't been caught. I want That's to, the ones that are in jail. Good. Let's talk about that. Okay. I don't know what the number of prisoners in federal, what the number of prisoners in federal jails is. Let's throw out a number. 100,000? 20,000. Thank you. 28,000. Let's use 30,000. Nice round number. Let's say instead of 6%, let's call it 10% of them. Okay. 10% of well, how many? 30,000 30, is 3,000? 3. Okay. So there's 3,000. Uh, undocumented criminals in federal prisons. Let's just... No, they said 90,000. That's what the paper says, 90,000. It's on the paper, Dad. Right, yeah, if you can put around. your finger on that, on, on that, on the place where it says that. Look on the right here. Right. According to the Bureau of Justice Statistics, 90,000 non-citizens. Oh, you're confused. I'm sorry. This does not say illegals. It says non-citizens. There's a huge difference. A non-citizen is either an undocumented or a green card holder or a high-tech visa worker or a low-tech agricultural worker or a student visa holder or a visitor visa holder. Big difference between non-citizen and undocumented. That's part of the problem with immigration law. It's, I mean, it took me two years now, three years before, the first year I practiced immigration law, I was like, wow, I'm getting people green cards. I mean, this was back when we didn't have the vicious circle, all right? And the vicious circle kicked in, and then I started realizing how far more complex immigration law is than when I first started doing it. I had cold sweats every night for two years, realizing the risks I had taken in people's lives. And now I am very careful before I move on stuff. And you know, there's non-citizen, there's immigrant, there's visa, there's this, that. It's very complicated, folks. Just keep in mind, there's no way for a good, law-abiding, hard-working person over there to come over here, and if they do, there's no way for them to legalize. All of a sudden, you start, and if you realize that our economy is sucking them out of those countries and bringing them up here, you know, if we create, A, a system for them to come legally, and B, uh, and this, that's what Kennedy McCain is about, all right? So let's talk about Kennedy McCain, perfectly in. And that's number two on that list that I gave you. Is it? Yes, Kenny McCain. Senator Kennedy, Democrat, Massachusetts. Uh, John McCain, uh, Republican of Arizona. Kenny McCain says it's going to create this intermediate visa. So now we will be able to have people come in and work and do it legally. And for the ones who broke the law, the ones who lied to get a visa and worked, a visitor visa and worked, and the ones who came in over the border, right now the problem with the law is there's only one punishment for those civil, not criminal, civil violations. And that one punishment is no green card, you get deported. Which, for people who have been living here five years, 10 years, 15 years, who are deacons at their churches, raising money for United Way, et cetera, et cetera. And there are immigrants who do that. They don't tend to be a Kennedy Park. Those tend to be some of the newer guys. Don't call them Kennedy Park people representative of all the immigrants there. They're definitely not, but time's running out. Okay, got it. So, um, so what Kenny McCain does is says, you broke the law, we're creating a new penalty, a new punishment. And the punishment is going to be, number one, you're going to have to pay one, two, X thousands of dollars. Number two, you're going to go to the very end of the line and it's going to take you years, maybe decades for you to get green cards. And green cards, remember, are not citizenship. Once you get your green card, you've got to wait a whole other five years, and we get to have a really good look at you. Are you working hard? Are you on welfare? Are you breaking the law? Because if you do any of that stuff, you don't get your citizenship, they take away your green card, and they deport you. So that's what Kennedy McCain says. It'll create a legal way for people to come in. It'll reduce the numbers of people lying to come in or sneaking in. Uh, 
And why would they become elite? And why in the world would they walk three days in the Arizona desert and have X percentage of them die? And deal with after 10 years, they're going to be. Why would they pay $10,000 to a coyote? A coyote, by the way, is the slang term for the guy who smuggles you across the border. Why would they pay ten thousand dollars to a coyote if they could pay five hundred bucks and get a legal visa to come here and work and not have to worry about all that stuff? I mean, I don't know. Just how many visas are you going to make? However many the economy seems to be able to handle. Ten thousand. That, that's that's a year, I, I think, a year, I, think the, a year. I, I think the idea is to is to permit five hundred thousand people a year to come in and work. Not no, I'm sorry, not five thousand. Five hundred thousand this year. Then five hundred thousand in the long run. 500,000 in the next year, is to have a stable population of rising and lowering 500,000 um, who would be, or do, be here doing work. And there's a lot of studies, and some of them say we need to export people, and other people say we need to import 10 million. And a lot of them congregate around this half a million figure. So Kenny McCain would permit a legal way to come in and would create new punishments and delays, but permit people who broke civil laws, not criminal laws, civil laws, to pay their debt to society and move on. Uh, Sensen Brenner King, the third one that you see on this piece of paper here, Sensen Brenner King is a law that says all the 10 or 11 or 12 million undocumented immigrants currently in the United States working as busboys, waiters, cooks, taking care of your children, cutting your lawn while they're taking care of your children, making the beds in the hotels, uh, sowing the crops, reaping the crops, transporting the food, etc., etc., etc that all these 12 million people are going to get promoted. Right now, they're all civil law violators. They're going to get, they're going to get a double promotion. They're going to get promoted past mis criminal misdemeanor up to criminal felons. Now, I don't know how many criminal felons there are in the country now. You know, people with armed robbery, you know, uh, 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 you know, assault with a dangerous weapon, murder, etc. You know, let's say the number is half a million or a million felons in the United States. We're going to boost that number to 12 million people with the sense of bread bill. Because all those 12 million will be recategorized overnight. They didn't do anything, but they woke up the next morning and they're felons. It will also make church workers, nonprofit organization volunteers who give an, an undocumented immigrant in the desert some water to drink or an undocumented immigrant who has been at Kennedy Park for three weeks and hasn't gotten work and doesn't have food, food, it will make them criminals also. I don't like Sensenberg. Question? Yeah, I thought it was against the Constitution to make a law retroactive to past people. That a law can only go forward from the date it's passed a few right. Years. Well, that, that, I think that's true for criminal law. Well, that's what uh, but they do it all the time. Law. They do it all the time in immigration law. But what? What? Well, it's very easy to craft the law. What it is is you say being here without authorization is a felony. Felony. So at the strike of midnight, they are here. They don't have authorization. They just committed a felony. Is that the way the law is written? I have not read the law. This is my understanding of the law. But you don't really know. Well, it's legislation. It's not actually law. And there's okay. and the sense of Brenner King. You realize I pulled out three here. There's 50 of them. The, the, the mayor showed you a chart with you know 70 of them, and they go on the spectrum from Kennedy, from Senator King, which by the way passed the House in December. Chris Shays voted for it. Bob Simmons voted for it. Nancy Johnson voted for it. Right now, this week in the Senate, they're debating Senator Brenner King, Kennedy McCain, or some sort of mixture in between. Uh, Mr. Gaw uh, Gawain Hussain, it, is it question and answer time? Is that no, no. Five minutes, five minutes we get kicked out, is that the deal? Right. All right, so if you got questions, ask them quick. We're finished? That's it? I say one about the lettuce. I'm just going to... I, I won't hand you the microphone, but I'd like you to hold it for me. Will you do that? No. Okay. Uh, I just want to say one thing about the lettuce, because that's so important. Uh, <laughs> Uh, J.D. Hayworth is a congressman from Arizona, and he wrote a book. It's called Anything It Takes. And he actually did a study on the lettuce. You can buy this book at Costco or uh, Barnes & Noble. And he said that if no illegal immigrants were harvesting the lettuce, the price would go up less than 25 cents. 
I have no knowledge of the study, but what captures my imagination, what captures my imagination is the Guatemalan stone wall. Mm -hmm. And maybe part of that study is if it goes up 25 cents, you know, you're going to lose 10% of the lettuce market. I, I don't know the answer to that question. But, but I do know that, that the economics of the whole thing is not nearly as simple as it seems. And that, you know, even studies that say, well, you know, undocumented immigrants pay X amount into the system, or, or undocumented immigrants, if you legalize them, will pay X amount of the system, they'll take out this much more. That leaves out a lot in the equation about, you know, their children growing up and replenishing our population, which otherwise would be dwindling and would, would make our country less powerful, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Can I, can I comment on that? Um, I think what you overlooked is the collateral damage to the citizens. You know, when that stone falls on a guy's leg and breaks his leg, the contractor points to the emergency room. So he goes to the emergency room, he incurs $30,000 worth of hospital bills, and the hospital swallows it. I agree with you 100%, which is why I say, let's find a punishment that's less than deportation, but more than nothing, like Kennedy McCain, uh, fines of thousands of dollars, extra years of waiting to become legal. Uh, in the meantime, give them work permits that are much more easily to, uh, uh, retractable than green cards, uh, so that we can get them into the system, we can get them plugged in, we know who they are, and it'll be easier to find our next Mohammed Atta. Two other very quick facts. The, uh, how many people, let's take a little vote. How many people here say undocumented immigrants? The ones who are, don't have you know, social security numbers, or I shouldn't say that. The ones who are not legally here, or not, work, not legally working. How, how many people say most of them pay taxes? How many people say most of them do not pay taxes? How many people say, I don't know? And anybody not want to raise their hand? All right. So the uh, IRS. The IRS estimates that 75% of undocumented immigrants do pay taxes. Why? They made up a social security number, they borrowed a social security number, and they are using it to work. They are paying into the system because their wages tend to be lower, they don't get a refund at the end of the year, which means they're actually paying more than citizens into the system. Is that a criminal violation of the law? Uh, it's a criminal violation of the law to use a social security number that is made up, that uh, or that is borrowed, or Etc. Absolutely yes. Um, so I guess 75% of them are violating that law. Um, now, okay, Social Security Administration. Social Security Administration says that they receive nine to eleven billion dollars a year from undocumented immigrants. And in fact, since Social Security was established, they have received a grand total of five hundred billion dollars from undocumented immigrants. I'm thinking if we just sold green cards for 10,000 bucks a pop, we could, let, we could put aside the federal debt. I think our time is up. Yes, yes, all right, I want to thank you all very much for coming. I have some time here. There's going to be a demonstration in Norwalk uh, about pro-immigration laws uh, this Saturday at noon, the following Saturday in Port Chester. We are looking to have demonstrations in Danbury and find some local hosts. And in Norwalk and in Bridgeport, these are flyers. Feel free to come pick up as many as you want to pass out. I thank want you to very thank much. Melbourne for uh, devoting his time and uh, coming and talking to us. And uh, I thank you very much on, uh, on behalf of the Denver Committee of Home World Peace and on behalf of all of us. Give him a hand. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, well, I'm John Go. I am introducing you to a very fine lady who is going to say a few words over here. She is the Minister for the Unitarian. Universalist uh, Congregation of Danbury, and she will introduce herself and talk uh, about herself. I want to keep you another minute or so. Um, my name is Linda Hansen. When Mr. Abba asked me to speak here, he asked me to do the closing words for us. Um, and from the perspective of a faith tradition, of course, I cannot speak to all of the faith traditions which we may pull on. Should I use the other one? No. But when I think about what characterizes the great religious traditions, it seems to me that compassion is perhaps the key, the deepest value. And compassion means that we suffer.
suffer with others, that we feel with others. And what seems to me most important in these conversations is that we look for and come to appreciate one another's viewpoint, not just the, the statements that are coming out of our heads, but the stories that underlie them, that we come to know the stories, why we care about certain things, why we're afraid of certain things, what kind of world we want for ourselves and our children. The Dalai Lama has been quoted as saying that his true religion is kindness. And I take that to mean that not just kindness in terms of what we do for one another day by day, but that we come to recognize that we as human beings are of a kind with one another, that we all belong in a sense to the same family, that what happens to any one of us affects all of us. And so however we come at this debate, it seems crucial that we come at it with that sort of respect for one another and with compassion in our hearts. So let us go tonight in compassion for one another.